Hi, uh, I'm Mike. I'm one of the uh, surgical um, trainees from London. Uh, I'm one of Ed's friends um, from university, and basically I sapped all of his notes during university, and I'm still doing it. And uh, he asked me to do some talks about surgical stuff, and I said no. And then he offered me an Xbox 360, and I said yes. So uh, <laughs> I've got his old Xbox, which is no longer working. So. Um, if this is shit, that's, that's fine. The Xbox didn't work. Um, most of this I did last night in the hotel room when I was listening to um, Andy on his stag do, which is the guy from Newcastle in the room next to me. So um, it, <laughs> it might not be that great. But um, just feel free to shout things, uh, ask anything you want. I, I know everyone's at different levels, um, but I've also been told that everyone does the same level of sort of exam. Is that, is that right? They do the same exam. So um, I'm trying to give a level which I think is roughly what you, what you, what you need for finals. Um, most of the teaching I've done is just clinical teaching um, as opposed to mass orgies like this. It's been, <laughs> it's been five or six people by a bedside. Um, and I've taken about, I'm on about 40, I've done 40 final year students now. And they've all passed and some of them have been proper retorts, so I'm sure you'll be fine. Uh, we'll go to quick tips. We'll do quick tips uh, at the end. I think just make a box saying quick tips, and I'll come up with some towards the end. Ed wanted that to be put in, and um, I will give you some tips, but um, it will come out as, as we progress. So this first lecture is probably my most boring one. It's surgical fluids, and um, it's not just surgical fluids. It's fluids in surgery. Um, and it's probably the most important thing that you'll learn um, before coming into being a house officer. Because as a house officer, 90% of your stuff will be fluid management. And that's something that's it's very poorly taught, and it's very easily to do very badly in it. Um, so the overview is just fluids in a nutshell. So just a brief what we're doing. Pre-op fluids, post-op fluids, fluid resus, fluid status, and management, and the house officer guide to the 3 AM fluid call. So those are, that's what you've got to look forward to. And we'll do this nice and, nice and quick. So types of fluids are mainly crystalloid colloid or blood. Um, obviously, blood is a sort of type of colloid. So what type of crystalloids do we have? Just, just shout. By the way, I, I will pick on people as, because, you know, in case you might not, I'm very ginger, so I can pick on people. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get picked on all the bloody times, so I don't, I've got no qualms about doing it. So um, what types of fluids do we have? It's normal saline, yep. And how much, how much sodium do we have in normal saline? 154, yes, winner. OK, um, what, what other type of crystalloids do we have? Dextrose, yeah. And what other types? Hartmann's, OK. So when is normal saline a good, what, what's normal saline? When do you use that? What is, what's your, I mean, not specifically. I'm not talking about it. But you just use it for people that are just losing things, don't you? So you replace, the rule of fluids is replace like with like. So if people are losing blood, you replace bloods. If people are vomiting or shitting, you replace it with normal saline for the most part, OK? Um, and what other type of crystalloids do they have loved in surgery? That's, that's your P. Yeah, dextrose 5%. Yeah, any other ones? Ring, was that Ringer's lactate? OK, so Hartman's as well. So Hartman's is loved by surgeons. And when do, we use, when do surgeons use Hartman's? So it's usually used intraoperatively. Um, and why is Hartman's different? What's it got in it? Is that my chest hair? <laughs> Ginger rug. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> what? All right, we digress. Come on, guys. Come on. Sir. Why? Why is Hart What's Hartman's got in it? It's got calcium. It's got what else has got in it? Lactate in it. Yeah. What is, what's lactate? Why is lactate in there? What's it doing? What's it? You can't remember. OK, that's no problem. So lactate does help with pH. So lactate, metabolized by the liver, effectively becomes like bicarbonate. So it's like giving someone. We don't usually give people bicarbonate that often. But that's the way lactate is used. Okay? So they use it in a theater because it's, it's, it's meant to be the more physiological type solution. And anesthetists, they don't really like normal saline. Surgeons don't really understand fluids, so we just give everyone Hartman's for the most part. Okay, but it's not something that I think, as a house officer, you use that often, unless it's uh, intraoperatively or immediately postoperatively. Okay, um, and colloid. What type of colloids do we get? 
So albumin is a type of collard, yeah. It's not something that we, you, you, know, you rarely give. When, so in a surgical situation, you give albumin. When some, someone's very low in albumin, you can give it to, through the vein. And other cases you give it is if you're, doing, um, if you're taking off a massive ascites, then you need to start replacing albumin then. And do you know why that is? So if someone's got ascites secondary to hypo, so they've got low albumin, why, why would we need to replace the albumin? So if we suck all of that stuff out of their stomach, then it will just reaccumulate, won't it? So we, we have to give some back. So that's when you can use human albumin. Um, what other types of colloids? So colloids we've just got, so it's high protein, isn't it? And what's the difference between colloid and crystalloid? What's your thinking? Oncotic pressure. pressures, yeah. So what, in a nutshell, um, where does, where does what, why colloid? That's right. So colloid will stay in your intravascular space longer. So do you understand the difference between an intravascular and an extravascular, oh, intra, intracellular spaces as well? So do you understand the spaces of the body? So when you measure someone's blood pressure, what space are you effectively? It's the intravascular space, isn't it? So that's, that's, it will all eventually end up somewhere else, but a colloid will stay longer there, whereas a crystalloid, in essence, won't. Okay? Uh, and blood, when do we use blood? So we use, I've already told you, we use blood like for like. So if someone's hemorrhaging or someone's got a low HB, what sort of HBs do we start transfusing at? Eight. Ten, eight, ten, ten. It's, it's a bit of a, uh, a crap question, which is more like, guess what I'm thinking? But it's, if patients are symptomatic, um, if someone's got cardiac issues, you, you could transfuse them sooner. But in essence, if they've lost blood, you probably end up giving them blood. Okay. So you've already answered all of those questions already. So normal saline, 154 sodium, dextrose saline, 5% dextrose. So 5% dextrose, that's not giving someone sugar. Okay, that's just giving someone water. So what does, that, what does, the, what does the dextrose do? What, what is the dextrose? What's the point of dextrose in dextrose? Say again, sorry? Yeah, so it's all about the, the gradients, isn't it? So, so that 50 grams of dextrose, you're not upping their, their blood sugars with that. That's, that's it's rubbish. It's just giving them pure water in essence. Um, yeah, we've spoken about that. <coughs> One thing to note about synthetic um, uh, colloids and stuff, is colloids can give you anaphylaxis. So, they're, they're, so that's something that, it's one of those ones that can come up in MCQs. It, it can give you anaphylaxis. So, yeah, we'll come back to, yeah, okay. How much fluid do you need a day? Who's, who's quick? Who's watching the screen? Three, three liters. So you need three liters of fluid a day. How much sodium do you need a day? Hundred. You need a hundred. How much potassium do you need a day? Sixty. Yeah. So you need a hundred millimoles of sodium. How much did we say was in a normal bag of saline? You're listening. You are listening. You're on the ball. Yeah. 154. So if you give someone three bags of normal saline, that's not a good idea, is it? No. Um, potassium. You need 20. So none of those bags of crystalloids we 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 looked at actually had potassium to start off with. So that's something you're going to have to add. Okay, so if someone's got a low sodium, what might some of the signs be of that? So say, for example, your, your fellow house officer has given this old grandma you know, seven liters of dextrose, and you come to see her, well, how might she be? So you've not checked her bloods yet, you've not done anything, but how do you think, why would the nurses call you about her? She'll be confused, yeah. And then you, you'll, you'll take some bloods, you might do, you might do how, how could you get a blood result quickly? So it's 3 a.m. in the morning. You could do an ABG machine. So you, get, you, don't have to do a, you don't have to subject the woman to stabbing around ephemerals or doing a radial artery. You could just take some blood, and you do it in the same needle, and you put it in the blood gas machine, and it gives you an instant reading. You, you don't care about the PO2 or the CO2 or anything like that. You just care about the, the sodium and the electrolytes. We'll give you the electrolytes. Um, and then potassium. If someone's not getting any potassium, how might they present? Why is the nurse calling you about them? So the same thing, they can also be confused. How else might they be? So either way, they might be, they might be tachycardic as well. Might they? they might have a cardiac disturbance, secondary to being hypo or hyperkalemic. Okay, and those are things that you need to, to watch out for. So preoperatively, so you get a patient, elective procedure, they come in, they nail by mouth from midnight. Okay? If someone comes in, been in a, a, a car crash, or we'll go through some stuff later. Someone comes in, they're nil by mouth, okay? Until a surgeon says they're not for an operation, they're nil by mouth. 
So as soon as you feed someone, they can't have an operation for six hours. So that's, that's your, that's, as a house officer, when you come, um, that might be your responsibility to say, well, let's just keep this patient in by mouth. And no one's going to starve in six hours, no matter how. It's usually the fat people that complain, and they can, <laughs> they can do without eating for a bit. Um, <laughs> so take in consideration. So if you've got someone fasting overnight, so come in, elect, elective hip replacement, you, you as a house officer write up the fluids for overnight. So you write up two or three bags of fluids, okay, ready to go, eight hourly bags. So that's 24 divided by three. That's eight hourly bag, okay? And you want, the thing to remember about fluids is if, you get, if you're giving someone an eight liter bag, you're not giving them much an hour. Or you, someone do some math for me. How much are we doing? So a liter over eight hours, how much is that? How many mils is that an hour? One, it's 125. It's 125, isn't it? How much is 125 of fluid? It's not much, is it? Over an hour. So you're effectively giving them a teaspoon of fluid every. So you get a house officer, they'll call you up and go, I'm not sure whether or not to give them either an eight hour bag or a 10 hour bag. And you say to yourself, well, what, what are you debating? It's not much, there's not much difference in fluids, is there? So the normal protocol is one sweet, two salty. No, I said that the wrong way around. <laughs> one, <laughs> one salty, two sweet. So three liters of fluid, OK? And then if you give them 20 of potassium in each, that's you giving them 60 a day, isn't it? OK? And I've put in there, you need to take into consideration the patient demographics, right? So if a guy comes in, he's fluid overload, he's got big heart failure, you're not going to give him three liters, OK? If it's a little grandma, you might think twice about giving her three liters, OK? And it, 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 you think about the demographics as well. So postoperatively, we avoid potassium for the first 48 hours. Okay, any reasons why? Give it a shout, come on, mate. Yeah. So where's the potassium in the body? Yeah, it's in the cells, isn't it? What are you doing in surgery? You're effectively doing some very nasty stuff to a human being when they're unconscious, aren't you? So that's going to release a, tons of potassium, isn't it? Okay. So you don't get a massive spike in potassium. It's not something to watch out for. But just don't give them potassium as well. You don't want to add insult to injury, really, by adding, <coughs> giving them more. Um, so you often get called to see these post-operative patients. And it will be, can you prescribe some, can you give, oh, doctor, the fluids have ran out. Because basically, the anesthetists are very good at writing one bag of fluid. And then they come out from theater at 6 o'clock in the evening. And then the poor house officer gets called at 3 in the morning to, to give him a bag of fluid. Because the anesthetist doesn't want to give him too many. Um, I would suggest reading the operation note. Okay? Find out what the losses are. So the operation note, m m most hospitals will either be electronic or there'll be a little red tab on it. Okay? Have a read of that. That's also one of my quick tips, in case you're wondering. It's always read op notes. It's one of those things you can do as a med student. Find the notes, flick through, find the op notes. Because op notes will tell you exactly what happened. And they're written in a standard way. OK, so find out what happened in the operation. Um, check the pre-op observations. Why, why is that important to know what the pre-op observations are? So to know what's normal, yeah. Know what's normal for them. OK, so if this guy has got a blood pressure before the operation of 160, and his blood pressure now is 100, you might start thinking twice, wouldn't you? So you need to, you need to know what's normal for the patient. And it's the same with the little, little grandmas, which is, is what you get at the NHS. Um, so check the ins and outs, and we'll go over one of those in a second. Um, so ins and outs is the fluid ban balance. So most patients coming back from theatre will have a catheter in. Okay, and what's the magic number in urine output? Yeah, so not 0.5 to 1 mil of fluid per kilogram per hour. Okay, so I weigh exactly 80 kilograms, in case anyone's wondering how much I weigh. How much piss do I make in an hour? How much should I be making minimum? 40, yeah, smashing. That's great. OK. Um, watch out for fluid overload. What's the, what's the, what, what's the nurse going to call you about in the fluid overload? What are they going to say? What's going to be short of breath? Yeah. What else? So it might be a dematis, yeah. OK. Um, it's very difficult sometimes to tell whether or not a patient's fluid overloaded. What would your initial assessment be of someone that you thought might be fluid overloaded? What would you look at? So you look at a JVP, yeah? Well, then what would you do? Have a listen to the chest. What might you hear? Yeah. Then, then what would you do? Check the, check the fluid balance. Make sure you know what's going in, what's going out. And then if this patient's plus, plus, plus on the fluid balance, if they've got plus two liters, you have to think about what you're going to do with them. Okay? And 
people will tell you different things about using a diuretic to maybe off some fluid. So if someone's got this much fluid in their lungs, they're effectively drowning. You'll need to give them some frusamide, you know, through the vein, 40 milligrams. Okay, it's not something you know. It's something that happens. But if your if your colleagues are careful with the fluids, then um, it shouldn't happen. Um, the other thing you'll be called about is post-op pyrexia. Okay, doctor, he's got a temperature. He had an operation today. So in the first 24 hours, what sort of things are you thinking? So 24, first 24 hours, pretty early fatal exorcist, although it can happen. Um, so first 24 hours, so first 24 hours, it's a bit of a leading question. So again, you've just basically anesthetized a patient and caused them a tremendous amount of trauma. So it's a, a, a traumatic a response to trauma will give you a temperature. The other thing is, is you don't know what they were like preoperatively. So they could have had a preop infection, can they? And now it's just being, now you're checking after the operation. Um, after 24 hours, before 72 hours? Just any operation. So it's already been said at the top, atelectasis. Does everyone sort of understand what that is? So atelectasis is a little bit, it's, it's different from, you know, when people talk about collapsed lungs, they think about, you know, pneumothorax or something. It's not as fancy as that. Basically, when you, when you, when you have an operation, the patient might be unconscious for 10 hours. They then, they then have a tube down their mouth. They then are on a PCA, so they're dosing themselves up on morphine. What does morphine do to respiratory drive? Depresses it, so it's in it. The breathing once every hour. Oh, no, not. <laughs> but you, you get my drift. So basically, the the whole of the lungs isn't being expanded, okay? And so little segments of it will collapse, and it's just usually the bottom bits will collapse, and you get you get a subtle um, drop in saturations, but usually not much. X-ray won't show that much, but you know you can usually see something. And the way we get around that, there's nothing fancy for it. It's chest physio. If you, think, if you think they need chest physio urgently, you can call them out of hours. They won't thank you for it. But usually most post-op patients will, will um, get chest physio. The other thing is, is the simple stuff. So they have a pillow. So they get a pillow. They put it like that. And they take massive breaths in and out. They try and do that as many times as they can. And you might see next to the side of their bed these little ping pong balls. Have you seen those? We might have. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've been to a bed. But um, they do the ping pong balls. So they have to blow on them as hard as they can once every couple of, it's usually two or three times an hour, and you watch the ping pong balls go up. And that means they're working their lungs effectively enough. And that's how you get rid of atelectasis. Um, on the same line of the atelectasis, within the 72 hours, you can start to get infections. Okay? So it's a bit early to get a wound infection, but you can start to get chest infections. Okay? And the most common infection after an operation? Anyone? Common things are common, so what do you think it could be? Eh? Oh, there's a lot of mumbling. No, 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 God, no, we're not going that specific. No, 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 I'm doing surgery. We're not staff, we're not entrical. No, 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 no. <laughs> Where is the infection? Where is it? Chest. No, not chest. Not respiratory. Urine, urine, urine. So it's the we, yeah? So most people will get a catheter during an operation, okay? Not many people like having catheters, okay? comes out, they usually end up getting a urinary tract infection. The most common infection after an operation is a urinary tract infection, regardless of the operation. There you go, you write that one down, that's, that one comes up. Um, so we've got chest infection, urinary tract infection, you can start to get other things infected, wound infected. After 72 hours, start thinking about some of the fancy things, anastomotic leaks and things like that. Um, we'll talk about that, those in a bit. Um, and the other thing that is very, Common that we shouldn't miss here, which I almost forgot. Was anyone going to stop me and say, "Oh, you forgot DVT"? Because I did forget that. No. Yeah, DVT. Okay, so be tachycardic, unwell. Um, what else are we getting in a DVT? Singing. Yeah, okay. So, if you think someone's got a DVT, go to them, assess them. Squeeze the calves, make sure they're nice and soft. Look on the drug chart, make sure they've got all of their DVT prophylaxis written up. Your colleague might have forgotten to do that. Of course, you would never forget to do that. Check they got their TEDs on. There's lots of reasons why nurses don't put TEDs on. They're a pain in the ass to get on. That's the real reason, okay? TEDs, anyone know what it stands for? There you go. So they do exactly what they say on the tin. They get rid of it. They stop you getting clots. So they might not have those on. And then have a good listen to the chest. Get a fresh set of OBS. What might we see in the OBS? Tachycardia, yep. Yeah. And what's the ECG? 
you get an ECG. Because if anyone's tachycardic on the wards, you get an ECG, don't you? We'll see. Yeah, but the most common one is what? So that's the book. The book is telling you this S1, blah, blah, blah. But it's the sinus tachy, isn't it? So you just say, if you've got a sinus tachy, you're happy with that. You say, well, oh, actually, that could be something. So that's the most common, but it is all this S whatever. Was what it? Yeah, OK, fine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really look at ECGs very often anymore. Um, yeah, fine. And if you think they've got a PE, um, the saturations are going to drop off, aren't they? If they've got a massive PE, they're going to be hemodynamically unstable. You're going to be on the phone to someone senior pretty quickly. You're going to call a radiologist. You're going to try and get what image do you think you get? CTPA, usually, yeah. OK. VQ scan in a young, young woman. VQ scan in some hospitals is the first one. But some people, CTPA is a lot of radiation. So you always got to think about that. Um, we're going to go through all of these in different bits of the lecture, OK? So I won't go into them in too much detail. Pancreatitis is effectively an intra-abdominal burn, is the way to think about it, OK? You've got amylase leaking everywhere. You've got fluid. Your capillaries are leaky. They need a lot of fluid, OK? They are very dry, even if you don't think they are. Um, bowel obstruction we'll talk about later. Renal colic we might talk about later. Burns. Anyone know anything about burns? So how do we divide burns? So this, 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 you look at it, someone's got a burn. Say again? So it's, by, so it's by thickness. So what type of burns? So I think there's three types of burns, isn't there? So there's, yeah, so there's, so the partial, so someone just burns their hand on the, on the, on a, some boiling water. What's that? It's a partial thickness, isn't it? Yeah, and what, how, how does that feel? So they feel that, don't they? It stings. It's ouchy. It's red. It's hot. Okay, then what happens? What's the next one? The next one's going to be deeper down, OK? And that's going to blister. And it will still be effing painful, yeah? Then the final one is full thickness. Full thickness, what's that going to feel like? Nothing. You're going to feel nada, isn't it? And that's the one that you'll get this sort of white burn. And you'll think, well, that doesn't look like much. But you need to work out what type of burn it is. Is it electrical? Is it thermal? Is it heat? OK? And then you do it by percentage. OK, so anyone know how you, you estimate burns? Everyone knew the rule of nines, didn't they? Rule of nines, yeah. Wallace? Wallace, rule of nines? Ed, back me on that. Not just not once? OK, yeah. Uh, it's rule of nines. So does anyone want to elaborate? Go on, give me a hand. The head is nine, yeah. It's been ages since I've done this, so I'm, I'm literally actually, actually asking you the nines. Yeah. Isn't there something as well with with 1% as a hand or something, and you can... The perineum is 1%. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> as in your bits. The bits are 1. OK. Um, moving on from my bits. Um, shock. Very, very, very important. So why have I put it like a tennis match? Do I like tennis? OK. So the tennis match is, is I don't play tennis. I play table tennis, which is scored, com <laughs> scored completely differently, but much more fun. So it's, it's not to 15, isn't it? So that's, your, that's so how many stages we've got. So we've got four stages, haven't we? Yeah. So it's not to 15, 15 to 30, 30, 40, 40, love. That means you're dead. OK. Um, how much blood do you need to lose to get? How, what, what, so what's the blood in the first one? 750 mils, yeah. Then the next one is going to be, yeah. And then up at 750 each time. And then your, your four, your grade four, which is your 40 love, which is when you're in serious trouble, is two liters. Um, do we have, is it, is it there, is it? Is that it? Oh, let me just, should I put this, would, would, it, would it benefit seeing a table of it? Does that help people? Or is it, is it below you? Oh, that's beautiful. It doesn't show, I wish it showed up on this. This is a bit, this is redundant, isn't it? What's going on with that? Yeah. 
Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? What are you going to do with that? Are you going to copy it down? Are you going to re remember it? Or are you going to think about it later? Just use it as a learning tool. Okay, fine. Let's move on. So in fluid, we do fluid resource. Yeah, okay. So Ed's already spoken a little bit about fluid resource. Um, so I think one of the tips would be is that when you're in emergency or when you're doing any sort of surgery or medicine, when you're seeing a new patient who's been unwell or has come in unwell, I think you should start estimating what level of shock you think that patient's in. Because there's something that's very undermanaged. P patients always come in underfilled. Even if it's just someone's come in from a, a, a stag weekend and they've been pooing a lot or vomiting a lot, I think it's something that you need to, to work out. Um, and fluid resus is something that's very important. So it's too, you know, if you get a patient that's shocked, it's too lodgeable or cannulae into the, into the elbows, into your cupid fossa, and you're given two liters of normal saline straight away, okay? And that's, that, will, that, that will bolster it up. We'll go on to talk about that in a little bit more. So blood. Anyone a blood donor? Hands up if you donate blood. One. Oh, this is music to my ears. That's great. That's good. So how much do they take, roughly? 470 mils, yeah, about that, just under a pint. Okay. Um, what do they do with it then? Just put it in a bag. <laughs> put it in a bag. So when you give someone when you give someone blood, what are you what are you giving them? So if I write in the drug chart, so I write I write packed red cells, one unit, three to four hours, please sign. What what's the packed red cells? What's that about? So they take your blood, which you've kindly donated. We should all be blood donors, unless we have some reason not to. And um, they spin it. They take the, the, the packed red cells, the red blood cells. They put that in a solution, a bit of calcium and citrate, or citrate, actually. And that's roughly about 300 mils. What else do they get off of that? They get the platelets. Yeah, that's a little bag of platelets. What else do they get? They get the plasma, yeah. So interestingly enough, if you take the blood, you spin it down, you take your 475, you put it all back together, you get like 600 mils somehow of just spinning it. So that's the way they get extra. Um, what's the difference between a cross match and a group and save? So everyone loves watching ER. I don't know, maybe you're too young to watch ER. It's finished now. Maybe you watch something else. I don't know. But um, what's, what's, what's the cross match? So if someone comes in and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, cross match them four units, blah, blah. So it's quicker, but what is it? Is it just mean a lab technician works quicker? Oh, come on, what's that, Mumbles? What's that? So it's basically, cross match just means they get the patient's blood. You give them to them in the little pink jar that you've written, handwritten, and you printed it off, and you've done it really quickly, and you give it to them. They get the blood, and they just get, get it in a Petri dish, and they just drop some other blood in it, make sure it doesn't clot and look shit, and they give you that. And they say, that's cross-match. Okay, it's done very quickly. Okay. Um, what, so the group in SAVE is they take that blood. That takes a couple of hours. They run it through the lab. They make sure everything's HLA, this, that. And they give you a nice bit of blood. Okay. So if someone comes in and they're really unwell, you just say, can we just cross-match them four units? Just get me four units straight away. Okay. And if that patient's unwell, if you're in an emergency, what else would you give them? What else could you give them? Just give them an egg. So do you understand the concept of, I don't know if I fully understand the concept of it anymore, but Oneg is universal. If you're an Oneg blood, blood donor, they, they write you a letter like every two weeks saying, can you come, can you come, and no. Um, so blood, we've already said prescribing. Uh, we won't get into that in too much detail, but it's given over, you can't give it over four hours, otherwise it's shit. You have to give it under at least three hours, three to four hours you write on the drug chart, okay? Um, but you can give it, if you, if you need to give it quick, just give it as quick as you can. But the slowest you can give it is three hours. Um, complications, I think we m might save for another day. But just be aware that you're giving someone a foreign body, aren't you? You're giving someone some blood that's not theirs. So there's about, there's the, in surgery, we always classify things. This is not really a surgical thing, but it's immediate, delayed, and then further down the line, sort of chronic problems, OK? So you need to think about that. As soon as you give them blood, they need, they have, the nurses will do a set of obs on them all the time. Okay? And you can look those up, exactly what they are. Um, then you recheck the HB a couple hours later. And that's something that's one of those ones that everyone always hands over to you. 
so that you'll, you'll be the house officer, it'll be three in the morning and someone will say, the, you know, it'll be the house officer that comes at five and says, oh yeah, can you just check the HB, I cross-matched them this, I gave them two units, and you'll check it and it'll, be, it'll always be low, and you'll always end up doing a lot of work. FFP is very important, replacing your clotting factors, okay? Um, one of the things we didn't talk about in, sh in shock is it's all about end organ perfusion, okay? What end organs do we have? Well, we've got a lot of end organs, but it's a brain. So what's the brain? What's, so if you're not getting enough, if you're shocked, shut down, end organ perfusion, what's it doing to the brain? GCS, GCS will drop, yeah. What else have we got? Kidneys, what else? Will, so what will curtail? The urine output will fall off, okay? And then you can talk about the skin, yeah. Talk about, oh, they're cold, they're clammy, okay? Fluid monitoring, are they full yet? That's a tricky question. So how do we monitor people's fluids? We do the, the examinations that we've already spoken about, JVP, checking the OBS, okay? If they're in intensive care, how might they monitor the fluids? CVP, yeah. Do you, so CVP, how do we use a CVP, roughly? So if you're, if you're a house officer, you call to see someone, the CVP, they've got CVP in, how would you use that? Okay, so yeah, so you never look, you never look at one figure. You always look at the picture, the big picture. I mean, what's going on with the whole patient? But how do I use the CVP? So fluid challenge, yeah, we're fluid challenging people, aren't we? So what do we give them? Two fifty, yeah. Then what? Yeah. So if you get, so what? The, what? So it's three. You seem to know your CVPs. What's, you've got three, three outcomes, haven't you? What, what's going to happen? Okay, so you're optimistic that your fluid challenge is going to work straight away. So go up and stay up. So that's, that's happy days, isn't it? Go, go and watch Neighbours for a bit. Second, what's your second option? Go up, and fall back down. go up and fall back down. What does that tell you? So they're just, you, you, you're doing a good job, but they're teetering. And what's the, the final one? Nil response. Nil poire. You, you put it in, nothing happens. What do you do then? Just do another one. Yeah, so two, two 50s, you keep doing. The trick of all of the resus, and the thing that you say all the time is, once you make an intervention, once you've done something, once you've prescribed something, you check the outcome, okay? And that's good medicine, and that's good, that's even good surgery, okay? So you do something, you check. You give someone a liter of fluid, you've got low urine output, you check it, okay? Otherwise, that's when problems, that's when problems start to go. So, if you ever ask, whenever you make an intervention, you check what happens. It's the same with, you know, the fitting child, the asthmatic this, puffers, you check, okay? Um, so fluid chart. I've left this bit blank, I think. I did this last, actually I did this on the train. BE means bag emptied. It's nurse lingo. They always type that, write that in. Can someone work this out for us quickly? So, we've got fluids in. Someone's done the standard three liters. Bada bing, bada boom. He's had a cup of tea. He's had a soup. He's had some soup. 266. Just try and do it in your head. I've not got the mental capacity anymore. Anyone? Ed? Does that make sense, or am I a non winner with this one? I was a bit controversial whether or not to put it in. Because I didn't actually work it out myself, I just did it as quick as I could. So the PU, in case anyone's wondering, is urine output. NG not got stoma, I've written there. It's pretty high, isn't it? Okay, so that's a stoma loss. The bag's been emptied each time, so that's 600 plus 900 plus 600 plus 600. So three sixes are 18, that's, 200, that's 2,700 just in that. Urine output, it's 100, and then the bag's emptied, so that's 260, and that's 460, and then that's gonna be 770. Seven, Plus what I said earlier, that's going to be 3,400. So the negative, so 3,400 out, 266 in, so the 800. 266, good question. Let me see if I can work it out. And again, I did this yesterday on the train, which was delayed. Um, it was one liter, one liter, one liter, and then they stopped the fluid thing there and worked it out from there. So that's how many. Um, so it's just stopped on, it's just stopped before three liters. 
Should we just move on from this? Is this an <laughs> Didn't really work as well as it could have in a teaching output, is it? Moving swiftly on. Um, so you're an output. I guess what that was trying to say, okay, guys, the urine output is curtailed, and the stoma output is very high. Okay, so the patient's dry on the on the on the balance. Okay, and this is what you need to get. Whenever a, a nurse is going to call you, or someone calls you and says, you know, um, I, they've got low this, low that, low that. Ask them to do a fresh fresh set of obs. If you think it's a fluid management thing, get them to put them on a fluid balance chart. Okay, it's not that difficult to do. Um, so low urine output, up the speed of fluids, okay? If they've got a catheter in, what are you going to check? Uh, what? So you, okay, you check the bag, but they've told you that there's low urine output, so check, check what are you going to check? Check the catheters in, yeah? So you might need to replace a catheter. You can ask the nurses to have a, wa a waggle of it, so you can push it in further, flush it. There might be a clot in it, it might be something like that. See if you can palpate the bladder, okay? If you're happy that the bag's working, then you go on to how much urine they're making, okay? So your options are you can speed the fluids up or you can bolus them, okay? And for the most part, speeding the fluids up is, is usually enough, okay? So you're in the middle of the night, they're on a 10-hour bag, you look at the fluids, let's up it to four hourly, I'll see them in four hours, okay? And there'll be a lag, there'll be a couple hour lag, it will come, it will come back around, so you don't need to worry. <laughs> Low BP is very similar, so low BP you're going to check. You're going to make sure in, in surgical situation there's not a hemorrhage floating around somewhere. So check what their HB is. So make sure someone's checked their HB postoperatively. If they haven't done so, you do it. If you're not sure it's accurate or you're at all worried, just check it again. And you can do that on venous blood gas at 3 in the morning. Uh, fluids ran out. Okay, we'll just skip that. Okay. Um, I currently work for the Ministry of Defense in an Army Rehab Hospital, which is... Um, with all the guys coming back from Afghanistan. And this is the new type of resus that's coming out. And basically, um, this is not on any syllabus. This is just to try and teach something that's coming new. But um, the Army is always a little bit ahead in, in things um, when it comes to treatment of people. There's a lot of people coming back from Afghanistan. And they're coming back people that should be dead. And there's all these studies saying why they're surviving. And it's basically to do with the resus. And the resus that they use in the British Army is far superior to the American military. Um, the American military is still using very traditional methods, whereas the anesthetist that came and taught us was talking about their methods. So in army resource, they have, they come out with the, you know, guy gets unfortunately steps on something, a landmine, and they, they fly out and they have basically um, what they call shock packs, which is one to one to one. What do you think the ones are? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just a bag with all of them, right? So they have they'll have four units of everything, so they'll have a shitload of blood on them. And they'll come and they'll put some big big boy cannulas in and they'll give that straight away, okay? Um, triad of trauma is, is all about um, patients being acidotic, hypovolemic, and cold, okay? And that's new, okay? So they keep the patient very warm. They get the bear hugger on them very early. They get these metal blankets on them, okay? They, they fill them up and they avoid acidosis, okay? And then... This is a study done in, at the Royal London where um, one of the anaesthetists there basically was waiting for the helicopter to come in. And the helicopter would come in with the people that had come off of their motorbikes and crashed their cars somewhere in London. And he would take a set of bloods before any treatment had been given. Okay? And he would check all of it. He checked all of their clotting on them. He found that patients coming in that shocked, 60% of them were already coagulopathic. So they're already low on clotting factors. They're already bleeding out effectively, okay? And they're not entirely sure why it is, but even if you or I was to be hit by a car, we'd instantly be. And it's just a mechanism that the body has. Um, they don't use, so Camp Bastion is the, the largest um, army base in Afghanistan. They're using roughly 2,000 2, units of blood um, a month, which, to put it into perspective, is the same amount as that London is using. And um, in essence, um, they're saying that if you were to crash your motorbike outside the Royal London and break your leg and need an amputation or get your leg shot or unfortunately blown off in Afghanistan, you'd stand a better chance in Afghanistan than you would in the Royal London. And that's because of some of this army resource. So this might, it might be bullshit. It's not being fully you know, researched, but it might trickle down. It's just something to be aware of. I think it's, I think it's interesting. I don't know if you guys think it's crap. Um, the other thing that they, they're 
big on is um, resusing a patient to the radial pulse. So the conventional way is let's get them up to as, as big, a, big a volume as possible. Let's make them 120 systolic. And that's not being done in the army. So they basically have an, uh, a nurse with the finger on the finger on the pulse, literally, and they'll do it until they get a radial pulse. And the rationale behind that is that these guys have polytrauma; they've got damage to arteries that we don't even know which which arteries are done. Um, and if you fill them up to 120, you will blow off the clots that are keeping them alive. So they do it to the minimum, and then they resus them at Camp Bastion. They try and fix them up as best they can, and they fly them back to the UK. And they usually end up in the UK within 24 hours. So it's pretty, I think it's pretty impressive stuff. And that's that. Uh, any questions about fluids?